so yeah, I was just uh, giving the little time in between that anybody with the phone number could ch chime in. Okay. Aaron, thanks for noting your issue you picked up. Lakshmi, actually, could you um, type the issue? You chimed in on an issue. I think I wanted to raise everybody. Is, was that you? Yeah, yes. Um, if you would dig it up and yeah, let the me. link in. Um, I love the idea. I saw it on my phone when I was in the um, Muni this morning, so I didn't have a chance to chime back in. Um, yeah. But it looked great for me. So, um, so at minimum, we have a special guest coming at 1030. So um, we may ha not have time for to discuss all the open things, but I wanted to at least raise it for people to chime in on to give people um, a heads up that I would love to have people's feedback. Yeah, sure. Uh, yeah, I got it. All right. So since we um, have a um, exciting, busy agenda today, um, why don't we just start with check-ins, even though some people might still be rolling in. Um, I'll, uh, we'll go down the list in order. Robert. Hello, everyone. Yeah, I did a little uh, brainstorming on the life cycle document that you requested, Sarah. Um, and we'll oh, actually, I'm going to interrupt you because I realize we don't have scribes. Could I have two volunteers? Um, I'll do some scribing at least for the first half of the meeting. Thank you. Do we have anybody who um, somebody is volunteering? I will send the link again because you don't get to see chat history. Um, and I was, and so that is, I just sent the link to everyone. So thank you, Robert. Um, now you can start your check-in um, and I will, and Ash is gonna take notes too, yay. So we have a couple of scribes, which is fabulous. Okay, uh, just, I, I already noted also on the Google Doc. So uh, issue 152, which you assigned last week, I'll, I'll, I'll work on that a bit more. I just put some initial thoughts and then I'm, I'm hoping to get back to the formal uh, validation ideas, and other tickets, but that's about it. Um, great, thank you for helping out on the repo. We really appreciate that. Um, next up is Justin Cormack. Um, I haven't done much this week, but I think we, we should probably look to start the next um, um, the next uh, audit. Um, Yes, Justin actually is up next. Maybe you want to speak to that, as well as doing your check-in. Sure, yeah. Um, we did our TSC presentation for Intoto. Um, there, uh, because I think of the time frame, there was basically no discussion of what the TSC thought about the assessment itself or the process, which was uh, not the way I was hoping that would go. Um, I hope there will be a broader discussion at some point. And part of what they're supposed to do is, is there was some grumbling and complaints about um, how things were picked or who we picked or whatever else. So there are a bunch of people warmed up, but um, we can either just pick somebody and move ahead or let them bitch, us, bitch at us later, or we can go and ask them to tell us who um, they think we should do. And then they can fight amongst themselves for now and then, Come up, come to us with an answer. I'd prefer so, the latter. Do they, we want to? Do we want to officially go through? I mean, try and have, get some more time with them to go through the process. Yes. Out, so, uh, so I think that um, we'll do um, both things, right? So we have JJ has been trying to actually schedule time with our TOC liaisons at the same time and place, which has been a challenge. And then um, on the agenda is how do we prioritize security audits as well as like how do we organize ourselves with our TOC liaisons because we've been doing it via, you know, Slack conversations with Liz and Joe because they've been like kind of in the loop we've been checking in but we haven't had that like meeting of the minds. Um, and so I think that that will take some time, maybe as long as it will take to do a security audit. <laughs> yeah. Um, so like, let's just move forward with what we've been doing, like pick something and go. And then in parallel, we will formalize the process of prioritizing. Does that sound good? I think that's what you were suggesting, Capos. Just Justin Capos. Sure. 
Great. Do you want to add any more of a check-in, Justin? Um, oh, the, I mean, the other thing that I'd be interested in starting, what we had, we've got this issue around um, writing up the um, supply chain security document that's in, I forget which issue number it is. Let's put that on the agenda for next week. For we'll do a discussion. I mean, feel free to like keep moving forward on the issue, but I think we want to do the discussion of the supply chain proposal, just so we everybody has a chance to hear kind of about it. And but I think we have some volunteers, and there's nothing. Yeah, I think. I mean, I, mean, I was volunteering, and uh, the, um, yeah, we we had a few, we had a few more. I think so. I think. So yeah, I think just get started. Reach out to Santiago, and then we'll formally discuss it next week at whatever stage you're at. Okay. Um, Justin Capos, did you have any other wrap up, check in? No, I think that's fine. Super. Aaron. Um, yeah, so uh, just to, in an effort to get started, uh, uh, did a quick PR for changes to the uh, identity and access management um, uh, section of the landscape doc, hoping to, to try and address folks' concerns about differentiating between systems that support and manage uh, those things versus the like embedded libraries that are going to be in, in every single application. So uh, Robert, um, from your update, it sounds like uh, there's some more fundamental questions about the what the targeted point of the landscape thing is. So I'll, I'll um, uh, probably poke my head into your issue and, um, uh, and, and pull out and see uh, you know, what the right way to, to move forward with that is. Great. I look forward to reading that. Thanks for scrubbing in, Aaron, and said, like, um, let's all, like, I think wh whoever has some sense of the landscape and how it would be useful if um, people could, like, look at that PR and the issue and chime in, and then, you know, kind of we'll make a call in the next week whether it's ready for a discussion or whether we can resolve it offline, um, but really appreciate folks scrubbing in on that. And, um, the next up is me. Um, I um, uncharacteristically did very little with GitHub um, in the last uh, week. And um, luckily, Brandon chimed in and did some um, uh, GitHub wrangling and um, really appreciate everybody um, scrubbing in and picking up issues. Um, what I have been doing is um, I'm not, I think it might be cloud native. I'm not sure. I seem to have inherited a C++ client library that I'm trying to um, bring into the present and um, doing things like looking at like, oh, you know, upgrading from SSL v2, v3 to TLS. And um, what do we actually do if it's on a like IP camera? Like what is the security implications of being on a cloud connected device? So that's something that um, I'm learning about. If um, anybody just in my non-SIG security world, um, but if anybody actually knows um, stuff about security on IoT devices, I would love offline DMs and um, maybe we can, I, don't, I haven't heard that it's a priority for the group, but if we decide that that's a cloud native thing, then we could maybe bring some of that knowledge to the group. Ash. Uh, so I chimed in on the logo issue last week. Um, most of them looked really nice. Um, and I'm also, this week I'm working on uh, CFPs for KubeCon San Diego. Yay, what's the deadline? Friday. Friday, everybody should do CF, should submit talks. Thank you, Ash, for bringing that up and submitting a talk. My, Michael? Right, so I missed the last couple of ones, travel and other things. Uh, trying to focus on the microsite now, and I think we need to make a decision at some point in time because we keep going back and forth in terms of should we continue down that route that we initially had with Hugo, whatever, or something else. So, you know, I'd like to get that stuff out at some point in time. Even if it's minimal, then we can iterate, but. Uh, you know, getting it out is my highest priority. Yeah, I would love to have like an offline discussion about it if you want to pick a time that we both can make it and um, our, yeah. our remote colleague whose name I've forgotten. And we can just like fi find a time that three of us can make it and then we can just put it out to the group if anybody else wants to join in just so that we can have a live conversation cool. focused on that. I'll, I'll go back to the, the restrictive Slack channel and kick it off from there. That's Super. Cool. Thanks, Thank Michael. You. 
Lakshmi. Okay. Hey. Um, so I picked up issue 226, uh, which is new members page. Uh, and let me send you all the link in the chat. There it is. So I wrote some things about uh, what new members should do and what the whole group can uh, help them so that they can get familiar with the team sooner and contribute and deliver and learn as well. So that was the whole purpose. And then I added some simple things like, uh, first of all, their advice to join the uh, Slack group and introduce themselves uh, and then join the meeting, go through the repo and keep an eye out for the help wanted labels and issues. And then I also added one new thing. I don't know how, uh, how you all like it, but I just, uh, since we're just suggesting, I just said uh, every new member could be assigned a buddy, preferably in the same time zone. So these buddies can help uh, the new members uh, get up to speed and identify their areas areas of interest and assign them to the right peer group. So that was, uh, yeah, that was the recommendation. So I personally love that idea, but I think we would need a critical mass of buddies to yeah. be willing to kick it off. So I wanted to put a call out that if anybody could, is interested, would be willing to be a buddy um, or just is interested in this new member onboarding thing, um, if you could chime in on the issue, if we have you know at least four or five buddies across a couple time zones, then I think we could kick it off that way um, as long as there aren't any big objections. So um, we'd love folks to chime in there. Jonathan Meadows. I'm in a really unstable internet connection, so I might keep this brief. I've been doing a lot of work in GitHub, updating the threat modeling stuff finally, so I can send it to uh, Justin Cormack in a couple of days, which I intend to do uh, today. I couldn't hear you. Justin Cormack, can you chime in on what that was about, or maybe you? Uh, Jonathan's going to send me uh, the um, threat modeling work that he's been doing, I think. I'm hoping. Um, yes. <laughs> um, I'm going to send you some details to today, tomorrow. Um, Great. I would love to hear more about that. If you um, are, when you're ready to queue that to, up for a discussion, presentation, whatever format makes sense to you. Just uh, you know, DM me or add it to a future meeting. Um, I think that that's something that you know, like, it has come up many times in conversation. It, it would be yeah, and, and now I've updated it in GitHub, so that's when I'm going to send it to Justin and Great. Self. TK Lala. Yeah, I missed a couple of meetings last meeting, so maybe you know, out of sync a little bit. I was looking at uh, some of the edge security thing. I think I mentioned a few weeks back, uh, how that plays role into this uh, CNCF-based uh, security as well. So I uh, uh, don't have much to report on that one, but uh, it seems like it's quite relevant, uh, no matter how you look at it, whether uh, CNCF does it or there is a separate group called Edge under the uh, Linux Foundation. Uh, they do it, but they, they told me they were not doing it. So. <laughs> Great. And yeah, maybe we can have a little offline chat about that and figure out right. whether where, where it belongs. Um, right. I'm personally very. <laughs> yeah, I, I would be happy to contribute to that because I know a bunch of the people doing stuff. Um, super, super. Yeah, yeah that would be great because I think it's um, it's not wise to completely ignore that because Edge is playing a big role, bigger and bigger role. Um, and I think in the upcoming days uh, we will be seeing a lot more. So much of the computing is kind of shifting in different directions as it happens usually in any of the evolving technologies. So I think uh, somewhere we need to have a yeah. statement at least. <laughs> There's also a lot of overlap with non-edge stuff. It's just that people's priorities are slightly different at the moment. So a lot of the things that the, the edge people are interested in will become more mainstream in the future, I think. So yeah, so let's take a break out on and try to figure out a good concise summary of that and whether even the three of us are aligned and then we can kind of 
figure out whether we're going to propose it as a, as a CNCF SIG security thing or whether it belongs somewhere else. And I can help navigate and Justin Cormack also with the TOC and our TOC liaisons and kind of figure out where it lives. Um, great. great. Thanks, TK, for spearheading that. Um, Peter Benjamin. Is Peter on mute? Peter's muted. Give you another minute to see if you can unmute. All right, we'll come back to Peter. Emily Fox. Emily? I am here. Um, so we are supposed to be having a walkthrough of the on conference shortly. Um, we've got, um, we're kind of at a decision point and I updated the ticket, which was in last week's meeting notes regarding um, where we stand with the SIG security day. Uh, it's the issue 209 um, and the follow up comment. So after we get the discussion about unconference going, if anybody has a preference one way or another, formal or informal, please go ahead and comment in the ticket. Um, it will at least give us a better idea of what the community is looking to have. That's all I have for right now. Great, thanks, Emily. Christian Kemper. Can you, can you guys hear me? Uh, I'm on a phone, it feels like the 90s. Um, so the, um, there's not a lot of uh, stuff to report from me, but um, I guess we will go over uh, issue 165 later. Um, so so I, can, I can talk about that. Great. Carlos, Carlos. It has internet issues, we'll skip Carlos. John Manerick. All right, I'm going to skip the people with difficult audio. Feel free to add notes about your check-in. Um, we have somebody arriving at 1030, Kalia Young, who has, um, is an experienced facilitator, facilitator in open space. And so from 1030 to 11, we'll have her talk about open space, have questions from the group, and then um, anybody's welcome to stay, but not obliged to from 11 to 1130 we'll have the subgroup working on SIG Security Day kind of figure out, like talk more about that format and come up with something. So understand that not everybody had allocated that time, but feel free to stay on if you want or drop off at 11. So, um, so in the next 10 minutes, um, I'd love to, if Christian, you're willing to do this um, without uh, yes. visuals, um, I can bring up this issue and I think it's a, we can have a relatively short discussion, but um, this has been kind of in the queue for a while and would love to um, for you to just kick it off and talk a little bit about this concept. Yeah, let me give you a little bit of background. So I work for Google, for the people that don't know me, um, uh, on the um, identity and access management team. And um, at, at Google, we have a lot of internal projects that use the Google Cloud. Um, not surprising, and they have very strong needs in terms of um, uh, combining various security policies in a, in, a, in a good way. And we hear that from some of our customers as well. So if you are in a highly regulated industry, um, um, the, the, the idea that you need to combine multiple policies to have a desired effect um, is, is, is something that is uh, uh, that these teams are struggling with. And when we started thinking about that, there is really this notion of the platform team. So whenever a, a large customer like a bank or a, a, a healthcare company starts to engage with a cloud uh, provider, they need to inspect what policy options the cloud provider gives them, and then they need to decide how they can combine these uh, policy options in a way that makes it possible for them to let their administrators then administer the cloud resources in a way that is, you know, compliant with whatever compliance regimen there are under. And, and so I was wondering if that is maybe another persona that we should uh, uh, pay attention to. We call that kind of the platform implementer. 
And that is really a little bit different from the typical administrators that we that we talked about in the uh, in, in the personas that we have so far. Right? These are all. Um, administrators of a particular type of policy, but what these, these platform implementers really have to do is they need to, to have a kind of a holistic view of the existing policies and, and think about how to combine them. So typically you need to have some notion of there needs to be a, a, a networking boundary that needs to be established. You need to, you want to somehow make sure that people don't expose um, services they implement accidentally to the internet without going through some form of a firewall, right? So services that get exposed to the internet uh, need to need to be reviewed. Typically, um, there is um, a notion of making sure that if you have access policies, that you don't accidentally put somebody from outside of your organization into the access policy. So what are the controls for that? And various things like that. And I, I think when I spoke about this. A couple of, of weeks ago, there was somebody else that um, um, said that they yes that they are basically a platform implementer. And I I believe we probably have other platform implementers on the call. So I want to open it up for discussion. So what are the expectations of the platform implementers? Is that so, something that is worthwhile to look at? If I could ask a question, uh, what you're describing around especially sort of policies and control, I would have thought would be more likely the um, responsibility of a like security or audit persona um, rather than the implementer persona. Um, maybe both are shared. Um, are these different already? I'm, 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 I think I think they are different. So what what we have seen is that these um, um, platform implementers basically um, uh, implement business logic, so to speak, on top of the existing cloud providers policies um, so that you are, that, that the developers inside the organization are more constrained than what the, the cloud provider offers. And I suspect that, that these, 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 this business logic then gets reviewed by a security review, reviewer, right? So the security reviewer works in collaboration with these platform implementers to make sure that you cannot violate the security policies of an organization. So do we have any platform implementers on the call by any chance? That, that, that was my last job. I was actually both implementer and security. Um, ah, okay. Uh, so, so what are the challenges, right? So how, how could we as, as, as security CNCF raise awareness of, of this, this issue? So the, the, there's sort of two or three versions of this and, and I guess to speak to um, to speak to not not Google, but right. If what we're looking for is something like um, what AWS put out in terms of the the security adoption framework, where they say, "Here's the core things you need to know about logging. Here are the core things you need to know about network configuration." Um, so that's like one approach. Another thought would be to structure it by the most common, you know, really drop dead must do onboarding things um, in sort of a checklist format, like, you know, CIS sort of initial, initial, initial checks. Um, so there's a couple of those, like what would tend to happen is the security team would say like, here are the top things we're worried about. Um, and then platform would sort of have to figure out how to implement them uh, but then security needed a checklist to verify against. So, so those are the, you, you kind of need, it kind of ends up being used by both players, a, a best practice mm -hmm. checklist guide. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I'll just speak as a participant here. Um, like I've been involved in like SAS, pro, like be, creating tools that are designed as a SAS API. Right, and that sometimes you end up with situations where if it's on top of a platform, a public cloud platform, then sometimes you don't have the controls. You, you can implement anything you want, but you can't give those controls to your customer. So that's the thing that I see sometimes the 
you know, like if you're using somebody else's APIs, right, how do you then like delegate, like make it so that you can call an API that does this on behalf of your customer, I think is the- Yeah, thing. exactly. Exactly. So we sometimes think of these as you, you build, you're basically becoming an internal SaaS provider, right? So these platform implementers implement the, 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 the SaaS platform for their employer, right, their organization. Often this comes down to implementing secure defaults into the platform and the services. And that's some of the work that we've ended up doing before and, and effectively sending that out to the rest of the group. So it's not so much coding, it's just utilizing the same API we get from Amazon and just implementing the base level of security for other application developers to use. Yes, security force is certainly one aspect of it, but it's also sometimes um, that you need to make sure, I guess security force addresses that mostly. So I would think you need to make sure that uh, multiple policies don't interact in, an, in a surprising way. Right? Sometimes you may have the expectation that something is secure, but there's some other policy that is not set up correctly, but you know, security force would address that as well. Right, or like something like, um, I mean, there's always workarounds. You can always write code that does this, but I think like, you know, the platform will have the like, generate an access key that you have to do in the UI or on the command, like some way that you have to do with your superpowers, right? And it's then, if you want to provide a key to your customer, you have to be like, oh, now I have to build a whole subsystem that is exactly what the underlying platform has, except that I can't build a multi-tenant API on top of their thing. So that's where you can say it's like, you know, it's a, it's, it's a need, right? But of course you can serve your own needs, just compute and storage under the hood after all, right? Um, but those are some of those things where like, well, you know, it's sort of like, well, you can do anything as long as every customer gets its own instance of Kubernetes, like mm, maybe you don't want to do that. Um, so that's been my experience where sometimes you have to it feels like you have to like build a whole system on top of a system that ought to be providing that because you want yeah. to delegate part of it. Exactly. And, and so what are the aspects in the underlying system? Not, not, not if it's a cloud provider, obviously we don't have control over that, but in the CNCF, we could, we could help make that easier. Right. So, so there are some knobs missing to allow you to expose something so that you basically have to reinvent the wheel that is already, you know, perfectly working in, in, the, in the CNCF context. So what can we, how can we educate the, the CNCF to make that easier? So is there anybody else who hasn't spoken who has experience as a, somebody with this need? So uh, I, ha I have built uh, uh, APIs uh, that run in Kubernetes and, and Google Cloud in general. And Usually, when I when I build an API and give it out to users uh, who consume it, uh, the only thing I give them is a service account to access to IAP IAP permissions. So I was wondering if there are any minimum minimal things, uh, minimal permissions people would need to uh, consume those APIs or services. Uh, Maybe you can note them down and uh, start from there. Um, yeah, I think that, that's, that's a great idea. Christian, would you be willing to like kind of take the notes in this discussion and write some user stories on the issue and then kind of we can keep moving it forward offline? Sure, I can, I can try that. Um, um, uh, regarding services, I think that the problem that we have there is that Istio is not part of CNC apps. Istio really introduces this service code. Right, but, but uh, the Kubernetes service concept is somewhat weak. It's basically a load balanced endpoint. Um, whereas Istio um, has the idea that you have an endpoint that you can impose policy on, right, with Envoy. Which I, I believe Envoy is CNCF, is it? Um, yes, well, so it's a CNCF project. And I think that what we want to do is like, look at like what Envoy is doing in Kubernetes and Istio and, you know, Linkerd or whatever, and Linkerd is also a um, CNCF project which has that kind of like uh, probably is addressing this kind of a need. And I think like up level a bit and be like, as cloud native security, what are the things that are the like, what's the use case that is implemented by some of these things, 
or maybe is missing. And everybody's, you know, a lot of the things in the security space we're, we're finding um, a lot of the projects are replacing something that everybody is just writing custom code and scripts to do, right? And so mm -hmm. that's kind of this exciting emerging cloud native security is that we're actually starting to have some common tooling and services that address needs that so that everybody doesn't have to build their own special snowflake. Does that make sense, Chris? All right. Yes, yes. Let me take a step at that. Super. Thank you. Um, so now um, Kalia is joining us. I don't know if she's arrived yet. Um, but um, before, while we wait for her to arrive, are there any announcements for the group or upcoming events that people should be aware of? Just want to give everybody a chance to chime in. There was some discussion on the Slack channel that some people are coming to OSCON next week and might want to meet up. Um, someone should probably open an issue. I'm yeah, up. actually, if um, we can add a, a a going to OSCON, what we usually do is uh, put a a thing in the notes so that if anybody's on the call, you can chime in in the notes or the chat. And so people can know each other. If we have at least a few people, then usually we put up an issue and somebody volunteers to create a meeting space. And anybody else going to OSCON? Uh, I am, and I think Lorenzo said that he was as well. Cool, so, um, so we can wait to see if we have more people. Um, or you can decide that you're both going to meet up and <laughs> um, find a place that has a few more spaces and then we can pull in some people. So you can, you and Lorenzo can decide. I don't know who that was on the phone. Who was the OSCON person on the phone? It was, it was me, Emily Fox. Oh, great. So now I just know who you are so that if people, I hear OSCON murmurings, I can point people in your direction. Yep, no worries. Super. Any other announcements, upcoming things? I am just checking the... Just heard from Kalia that she's on her way. I will give a little bit of an introduction to this. Um, I'm here. You're here, yay. I will give then a, a part of the introduction, you can give the rest of the introduction. So I know Kalia um, because I attended this conference called She's Geeky that she used to do it ages ago because there were, there were apparently fewer of us, but actually there were a lot of us of a, non-male gender um, doing internet stuff ages ago. And that was a fab conference that maybe still goes on. But because of um, that conference, which is also an unconference, I, um, I learned about the Internet Identity Workshop, which I go to almost every year, <laughs> um, which Kalia invited me to many, many years ago when I was like, I don't think I have anything to do with internet identity. And then it turns out that Actually, it's a need I have, and many of my developers have always had. So, um, so it sort of overlaps a little bit with security space, um, and uh, and the SIG Security Day folks. Um, we had a, a side meeting where they were experienced with the like DockerCon hallway track kind of unconference thing that was going on there, and some um, some some open space things that I hadn't experienced. And so I'm inviting Kalia to talk about how the kind of conference style internet identity workshop food camp kind of thing that I've experienced, but probably couldn't explain as well as she could. And um, so she said she'd be willing to come tell us about how that works. And then, um, and then we can, we'll talk about what we're going to do of all the options. Thank you, Kalia. So um, please finish your introduction a little bit and, um, and then you can dive in.
and I will stop sharing our agenda. Upsuite, you are not on audio. You need to unmute. Oh, am I muted? Sorry. All Yay. the buttons. <laughs> um, and then play. Um, like Sarah said, um, I've been um, I've been um, designing and facilitating interactive events um, for professional technical communities for 15 years. Um, I I run, like she said, the internet identity workshop. So I'm also a subject matter expert in that field. And like in September, I'm going to go speak to the world bankers about all the identity stuff. But um, I also have throughout that time worked with other technical leaders who are like, your conferences are cool. Help us do one for our nerdy topic of choice. Um, and so this is um, me explaining sort of what that, what, what I do and what unconferences are and, um, and then we can talk more about what you guys are thinking about um, too. So here is like this grid of a typical conference, right? Like we've pre-planned everything. We know where it's all going to happen. And you end up with this dynamic where you have like the boring panel and the hallway refugees. Thing like we're out of here and then you have the cocktail party Woo! and so we end up with this like sort of in these two extremes and I like to talk about on-conference methods as being more more um, less organized than talking heads on a panel and more organized than a cocktail party. So it's a whole range of methods for supporting interactions between people that fits in between these two extremes and therefore has some benefits um, to uh, a sort of richness and aliveness that events um, can use. So, um, the method I use most, and I'll walk through, is open space technology, but there's many, there's other things as well. So with open space technology, you have an open and a closing circle. This is a circle from the Internet Identity Workshop that I lead. And in the middle, you have agenda creation tools. Um, and these are blank pieces of paper and markers. And what folks do is they come into the middle and they're invited to name um, topics that they would like to um, share a presentation about, uh, a burning topic that they want to discuss with peers, a problem that they're trying to solve. A, a, sort of, it's very open what people are invited to put forward. And whoever calls this session is the session like um, host. Um, and they are the ones who are are naming it and they get to decide where it goes on the agenda. Um, and the, the other thing that happens when we're sitting in the circle is the kind of rules of engagement for the day are outlined. And these are whoever comes are the right people. Whatever happens is the only thing that could have. Whenever it starts is the right time. And whenever it's over, it's over. And part of this is to support people culturally breaking out of the default norms in meetings where you stay if you're bored and you don't want that in an, in an open space because it brings the energy down in the, in the sessions and rooms. You want people who want to be there, basically. Um, and then, well, the other thing is this looseness. Not, it's not so much looseness on time. Like there is a time and space orientation, but you also want to help people go with the flow in terms of not not it's different um and this is the other the law of two feet um motion and responsibility if you're not learning or contributing it's your responsibility to respectfully get up and find somewhere that you will so this is also what i was talking about the energy thing about people not getting stuck and the butterfly and the bubbly represents people moving between sessions and I'm not feeling like they have to go to session. So this is, when I lead open space, I have everybody um, announce their 
set proposed topic in the circle while they're still sitting down so that all of the men need to listen to each other <laughs> instead of running at the wall to get it on the wall. Once everybody's announced their sessions, they get placed on the wall in a time and space. So so this user managed access one is in space I from 12 to one and that room has a projector. Um, this is what the wall looks like um, as people are kind of creating it and then this is without people in front of it. Um, and the thing that is um, here, so then breakout sessions happen. So each of one of those sessions is in a time and a place and people go off and do their thing. These are happy whiteboards from the session. So another key thing about open space technology is to support documentation. So it's like a system for getting folks to document what happened at the sessions. And those are then compiled into a book of proceedings that then supports knowledge and sharing and people being able to convince their boss next time that they should go to the cool conference. Um, more happy people nerding out doing sessions. So what happens in outcomes? Problems get explored, relationships are built. Problems can be explored to the depth they need. So one of the things that can happen is you can put part one and part two on the wall and keep going if you need to because there is this flexibility of time and space. Um, it's not over until it's over, right? Um, unlikely convergences occur, creativity is unleashed, and the community is made. So here's some other methods that I often work use with clients. This is the spectrogram where you're inviting people to uh, array themselves on a spectrum and you interview them like Oprah about why they have their opinions about certain things. There is a fishbowl, sometimes I call that an unpanel. Um, a key feature of the Internet Identity Workshop and, and the events that I like to um, design is that people eat together. Um, it really is a fundamental human thing and it's good to support. Um, community maps are something that I often, when I work with clients, support them making. Here's one that I, I got my internet identity workshop to make in an hour. It's got 400 post-its on it from 250 organizations that they participate in. Um, and then speed geeking is another format that allows, that's really great in technical communities for like um, demos. They're sort of like five minute demos done in distributed tables around a room. Um, repeated over an hour so that people go to different stations to see the demos that they want. Um, eating together again. <laughs> Here's the closing circle from She's Geeky, like Sarah mentioned. Um, another one from IAW. So this is the closing part of the day and we, um, we like to a good a practice that we do is to give gifts to um, so it's like open we call it open source gifting it's like the gifts are in the middle and people stand up and and honor people who did good things in the community or at the event itself so this is a way to sort of think about the orientation of, of a non-conference day you have like registration and breakfast you converge together in the opening you diverge for however many, however many number of breakout sections you have, and then you come together again in a closing circle. <laughs> um, and I, I, this is just a little bit more, uh, not quite theoretical. It's how I think about the facilitation practice. So, if we, if if the the shape of the the shape of the energy of the people that we're gathering together in the the event is a Taurus that typical when you have a speaker at the front of the room or you have one facilitator, um, you're, you're holding the space for the energy in the center and everything's going through the person in the middle holding that space. And that for an unconference, what you're doing is you're holding 
the space for the what's going to happen at the edge so that it's supporting more self-organizing like there's these there's the wall and there's the opening and the closing but within it people are more creative everything isn't having to go through that like central uh uh bottleneck of control so um and then these are two cards from the group work stack, which is this um, pattern language for meetings that are and gatherings that are really alive and sort of at the core of these methods are hosting and unholding space. So those are my, so, so that's sort of like open space plus some other unconference methods and and when I work with clients, I typically like work with them to the, to support them. You know, they know who they are as an organization and they know what they want to do. Um, but what are the goals that they have for the day? And then I typically work with them to support like a good design for the day and, and potentially facilitate the design um, for the day. Um, because open space is really easy if you follow the instructions but some people want to do extra and more things and and fitting it all together in a way that really um has a high probability of success is something that uh is easier when you've done it 200 times <laughs> so anyways i'm happy to um talk through anything i shared or understand more about what you guys are doing yeah, so we have 10 more minutes left for the bigger group, and then we'll have a half an hour for our small event organizing group. So I want to kind of open this up to just like, for, especially for people who have not experienced this, like there are no dumb questions. If you have a question, probably somebody else is like, I don't want to ask this thing. Like, just ask some questions about like, how does this work? So I guess it's only for face to face. Is that right? Or is there a virtual version of this? Um, so there are people who've developed open space technology, the software version. Um, and I've actually seen some people do this like experiment with maybe trying to do it with zoom. Um, but yes, the practices that I put forward in the, um, and, and on conferences are generally about the face to face. Um, yeah. Other questions? Maybe a dumb question here. As you said, um, why is it called on conference? There are a lot of people there going to be obviously in this group. And why is it a on conference? So you can you can call what you do whatever you want. I, I have no attachment to the name. Um, the the term arose because um, people were organizing these events that were face to face but didn't have pre programmed pre programmed sessions, like pre programmed like who's talking about where what in what room. So these break out of that mold because they're less organized than that. They're supporting um, participant-driven, attendee-driven content created lives the day that it happens. So does that mean no preparation needed and no real pre-objective was uh, determined? So that's that's a different question. So yes, that's so, a great question. That's a super good question. So it's really, and I missed this in what I was presenting. So it's really glad it's coming up now. Which is, it's really good to define why you're getting together. The name of the day and the invitation about what you hope to cover is a really um, important thing to do because that's what's going to get the right people there. Um, so that's something that definitely is um because no one's going to come if they don't know what you're going to talk about right <laughs> but instead of selling it as we know who's going to talk about what in which rooms you sell it as here's what we've identified as a set of issues 
that may or, that we're all exploring together and we're not really sure what the right answers are yet. I think one of the cool things about this, these methods is they really support those on the cutting edge of an industry being in a peer-to-peer -peer learning environment because they're all experts in some piece of it and they're trying to learn it from each other right at the edge of, of, of whatever industry that they're in. And this supports that happening really well. Um, so the other thing that we do for the Internet Identity Workshop is when people register to attend, we ask them what they think, what they want to present about, what they want to learn about, and what questions that they had. And we put those up and we say, these are what people answered when they registered. They may or may not happen, but at least you're seeing what people say they want to talk about, so it'll give you sense whether some of those things resonate with you. And if they do, you could come too and you'll find the people who want to talk about them here because these were things they named when they registered. And so sometimes there's like, I've been to some where there's like themes that are prepared ahead of time. Like what's your experience with how much framing, you know, and like how like tightly and loosely that is. So I think, opening? um, Theme. So I think that in, I think that, I mean, okay, you can name themes in your creation of an invitation. I think with under a thousand people, there's no need to do more different, like, the sort of the max number of people you can use this for anyways. I've thought about how you could have mini unconferences inside 2,000 person conferences and then you're sort of like being like hey all the people who want to talk about X show up in this room at this time and we'll do this unconference thing for three hours. Um, but that's different. Um, and I, I definitely would not have like rooms that have themes. I mean one of the things that's important about open space is that you have as much room there is no voting things off the island either. So when people name a thing, you let them have a meeting. There isn't like, oh, only two people want that, so you can't have a... A, you make rooms that aren't exactly rooms, so you name spaces in hallways, and you, you take your lunchroom, and you make table spaces. So you work on having really extensible space, not just... just the, the three formal rooms, right? It's like the three formal rooms and the lunch room and like those little nooks over there, they're all potential meeting spaces. And you, the, the whoever comes are the right people is like those three people who want to talk about X are going to have the most amazing conversation that they could have that day. And that's great because that, they may be so early that they're like two years later, that's like, taking up everybody's time, but they saw it first and they had the space to connect and can, you know, do their thing. So I hope that answers the question about, well. Yeah, that's super helpful for me. Other um, questions that people have before we break as a bigger group and break into the smaller group. Um, I mean, I just, one say that I, I do like the open spaces format and, uh, and unconference format. And I think it, given that um, KubeCon sometimes feels like a very structured thing in terms of the talks. And I think it, I, I would be in favor of having that kind of thing for a free event, because I think it would um, give it a more sort of, um, I don't know, uh, easier for people to get involved with format in a way that, that KubeCon feels quite um, exclusive sometimes in terms of people not being able to get talks accepted and things like that and, and it being quite hard to find ways to talk to people sometimes and if you don't know them and things like that. Thanks Justin. Any other, uh, yeah, people feel free to comment as well if you're, um, if you're not if you don't have yeah, time to be I, part I of this SIG Security Day sub-team, please chime in. 
Yeah, I just wanted to say um, my first unconference, I was a little bit apprehensive. I had to organize a, a large conference and my co-organizer suggested that we should do an unconference and I was super nervous that it wouldn't work out, right? But it was so, it worked surprisingly well. It worked so well that I, because we are all, we've all been to a conference where really the most important thing that we went to was the hallway track, right? And this is basically a whole session that is a well-organized hallway track. And it, it, is, it works really well. I just want to, so for people that are a bit apprehensive if this works, I just want to let them know that yes, it does. <laughs> All right, so we will break the bigger SIG security meeting. And um, thanks everybody for participating in your questions. Um, feel free to add questions in the notes if you have after questions and we can, or on Slack and we can, we, I think it'll be, we're going to have kind of a discussion today about what's the unconference format and what would it be if we did that? And then we're gonna circle around and be like, what are we actually gonna do as a follow on? Um, so there'll be a little time for people to chime in um, if you have some thoughts today. Um, feel free to shout out on Slack. Um, all right. So if you're uh, um, not inclined to stay for the next half hour, thank you for coming and we'll see you next week. And Kalia and our subgroup will stay on. Thank you. And then um, we have Emily, so um, should we just take notes, Emily, in the Google Doc for now and then copy them into the issue? I, I think that's fine. Okay. Or I can just pull up the issue and just write the notes as we go. Yeah, if you want to screen share the issue like you did last time, that'd be fab. Although in the Google Doc, then we can all help take notes, which means that we Yeah, I'll just do it in the Google Doc. Super. And then I can screen share that. Um, so, uh, Emily, would you volunteer to kick off in, like, just maybe you can just say who is represented here, um, of, or like who's in our little sub team, who is our organizing team while I screen share the notes? Um, so it's myself, Emily Fox, uh, JJ and Michael Ducey, who's currently out on vacation. And give me a sec, I gotta pull up the other people. Uh, Amy as well, and Emily Roth. Jennifer. Emily Roth is not yet on the call, um, but happy to be able okay. to. Okay. So. so, Amy, do you wanna Amy, just. Go, go ahead. ahead. <laughs> what did you want from me? Oh, I was gonna say, like, one of you mention what kind of roles we have on our organizing team. Oh, sure. Just yeah. so that Kalia knows kind of the people, the, the like, the type of people we have, like, kind of put this together. Um, yeah, uh, so I'm Amy Scavarda. I am the program manager over at CNCF, um, and I will be joined by Emily Ruff, who is our events person. So consider us staff. Um, we also have Jessica, oops, sorry, Jessica, Jennifer, um, I don't know if Jennifer. she's here. Jennifer, who is also experienced with organizing events from Cystic. So we have yeah. like, we have like Emily, me, JJ, or actually like Emily, JJ, Michael, who are more technologists worrying about like, what is the content that we want to have happen, right? And then we have some, a wealth of awesome experts who are going to help like make the thing happen. Um, with the logistics and all of those important things. Cool. So Emily, I'm going to pass it to you to like think about, well actually where's our issue? Yeah, um, I'm trying the, to find it. Um, yeah, I wanted to kind of kick off our goals because we have it somewhere. I'm good. <laughs> we actually have written down. 209? Yeah, that's the ticket number. Okay. I'm just going to click this and then edit. Two, oh, nine. 
So the whole like the whole point of us doing the security day is to allow a space for people in the cloud native security community to get together and to discuss problems, potentially work on resolving some of them, um, and really kind of increase awareness about security in cloud native because it's still very young. Cloud native is still pretty young, but security is even younger because we're always playing catch up. So yeah. the whole point of the day is to get everybody together and ha and allow them the opportunity to have conversations that are vendor agnostic, platform agnostic, and very much the open source and cloud native space. Because right now there's a lot of vendor security days and they usually end up being tutorials about a vendor product about how to secure your cloud native compute. And that's there's more to security in the cloud native landscape than just vendor products. There's other problems. There's data management problems. There's user identity problems. It's pretty extensive. So we had talked originally about doing um, a, a more formal forum for that, but we're not sure. I, Michael and I have had success individually in the past engaging in hallway tracks or other open space-like um, conversations with people about security. That's how Netflix got uh, feedback to do the bug bounty program for container isolation in containers. Um, it was actually from a hallway track and open space opportunity that they engaged in. And we want to allow the, that kind of innovation and those conversations to occur. So where yeah. we're at right now is if we do formal, the whole thing should kind of be formal. And we're running out of time to do a call for proposals. If we do informal, the whole thing should be informal. How do we best manage that? Given like very specific security related, we obviously need to correctly craft the invite and get that sent out. So right. that's kind of where we're at. Yeah. Yeah, and I think that there there was still like, if we, even if we do the informal thing that maybe we, do an invited kickoff presentation or panel. There's, I think that idea is still floating around, right? Like, right. should we yeah. have so, some kind of anchor draw or is that gonna just mess everything up? Uh, okay, let, I'll, let, so, um, so I think that, um, so I, I'm not, so when I'm, this is great to have, uh, okay, the goals for the day. Can you scroll up a little okay. bit? No, on the GitHub one. Yeah, there. Right, so this is, you've already got like, this is really fantastic, right? Like this is, the goal you have is to bring together the community to discuss, like these are all, and you, this, you've got potential topics, right? And you have even like impact. This is fantastic. So I would say that you, or, um, that it would be good to move towards using open space technology to support those conversations. So I often, like when I, like I also will put different things at the beginning or at the end or the middle, depending on what the goals and needs are, right? Um, and I think that that's where, this is where we're at with this conversation. Um, and I feel like I don't quite understand enough, but um yeah so maybe one I can, like, way that okay. you can one way that you can provide anchoring for people is to 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 sell who signed up to go already right so this is this is the the, the it's 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 mapping into the who's going to speak question that people have and you go these people are participating, they're coming, and they're probably gonna say interesting things because you know them from blah, 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 blah. But you're gonna find out when and where they're gonna say anything at opening circle, so you better be there, right? Like that's how you, you should take that kind of uh, thing that the signaling people are looking for, you signal in a similar way, but you go, but, but the agenda gets created live, so that's, where that's how this is different. Um, and I think, um, you know, I don't know enough about, you've been to speed geeking, Sarah. I don't know, like, would it make sense to do that in this context? One well, option. I think, 
doing something in the middle of the day, but I don't understand. Well, I think the, the challenge is, right, that there's, a, there's definitely a not large number of people in this SIG security thing who have been to unconferences or at least the hallway track at DockerCon who are like, oh my God, I'm so excited about that thing, right? And yeah. then um, KubeCon, which I don't think you've been to, is very high production value orchestrated. It's giant, right? Like you don't even, it's hard to even find somebody else. Like I've been like, oh, you were at KubeCon? I had no idea because there's thousands of people. Right, right, right. And so it's incredibly orchestrated and there's like, you know, everything is like fancy and like, so yeah, yeah, yeah. For, the, for people who have signed up, so this is, the idea is that they have these um, days before KubeCon, right? Yeah. Which tend to be vendor driven things, although there's like some exceptions because like all the uh, Kubernetes committers can get together in one place. And I don't even know what they do because I haven't, I'm not a Kubernetes committer. Um, but like, so the, I think the question I have is like, how would you prime the people who are coming expecting for this highly orchestrated thing, right? They, they know that that's what they're going to get on Tuesday through Thursday, right? Yes. And they need, they either have a need for internet security, right? <laughs> for yeah. Or they're like, or they're like a security expert, right? And they're like, hey, this is for me. I'd like to do this thing on Monday. But they've never experienced it on conference, right? right? How do you prime them? So like, they might just sign up and be like, I don't know what this thing is, but I, I can come on Monday. Or they might just yeah. be like, I don't know whether I want to come to this like touchy feely hippy dippy thing. Well, you don't call it. I mean, you can call it whatever you want. It, that doesn't sound hippy dippy. Um, I think the description you have already works. I have a bunch of language on my site that I work with clients. Like often, I get clients to write up what how they think they should describe open space to their audience and then I make sure that they don't say inaccurate things. Um, well, I guess the, um, the, the thing that I, it, like thinking of some of the people who ask me questions offline, yeah. right? This, they might be like, well, I'm not sure what I have to discuss, so I'm not sure I will come. Right, right. right? Like to have them realize that it's okay to just show up even if- Yeah, this is not bar camp. Right, so part of my, why I call them on, I have a blog on conference.net and, you know, one of the issues that we have had is that the folks who made bar camp copied it from foo camp, who copied it from open space technology and then left out critical design elements and then forgot to attribute it, what they did back to the source so people could Google find the source and decide whether they've made a good copy of it. So we had a bit of telephone happen in the community. So I think one of the things is to yeah. emphasize the opening. Well, I mean, it's hard because it's a Monday. So you want to emphasize the opening, but not to the extent that people whose flights arrive at 10 a.m. feel they can't go. Like, yes, show up. You can still stick your thing on the agenda at noon. It's fine. Um, but you want to... Um, and you want to emphasize the invitation. You want to get people who you know, who are known to say, yes, I'm going. And and even to have a list of, of the topics, like you guys, this is already a great list of topics. And I mean, the IIW list is so long. <laughs> Um, but it's a learning too. Like this question of what do you want to learn is put forward. So I think, I think you frame it as like creative and interactive and like one of your people before said is the structured hallway. Like it's a really well organized hallway track that's like really good because they are not lost because people have these signaling mechanisms in with the wall of saying what they want to talk about and when and where. So you can find each other as opposed to being lost in the hallway and hoping it randomly happens. So basically, definitely, like, one of the successes that we had with the Docker hallway tracks is that they had two to three coordinators 
actively working to organize where people meet at a specific time. Like they, everybody at what it, like, let's say one o'clock all showed up at one meeting point. The coordinator said, this space is free, go here. And like had that written down, like this discussion is happening over at this space and made that available for anybody else that wanted to show up and have that conversation. Okay, uh, cool. Uh, this, other than the opening facilitator, there is no coordinating needed by anybody. It's a lot. Okay. It's a, a low, it's very low. Um, like the, what, like I was saying, like the, you're holding the space at the edge. So people go do what they need to in the middle and they're the ones who are empowered to, like with open space, you can add a new session to the wall, right? And and they're also, hopefully you can be in a space where there's like space flexibility, you can accordion it out. Um, so either that's like a really large room that can be divided into lots of, like into subspace, like with tables and stuff, or you do have breakout rooms, which I recommend, but like the whole thing isn't just breakout rooms. So um, one that leads into one question, which is um, we, uh, Emily Ruff, it was doing some research on the space. So there, it may be that we are limited to a classroom setting, large room. If How many that, people do you think are coming? 50 to 100 is our guess, right? So we're going to like... a really nice space. size. I think so. Yeah. Um, so we were going to, we were thinking of like picking a 100 limit basically based on um, that like probably the number of people who come to these meetings is around 50. Um, and then um, we usually have like lots of people who like might just come, right? Who are right. part of our regular right um calls and stuff um so the question is if we so emily ruff is trying to find out whether we can actually have more of a flexible space right could we have round tables can we have like additional side rooms um and what are the options but what is sort of the pre-format is this um you can't do anything other than classroom seating um, yeah. Although we could probably use wall space or figure out some things to create side spaces, but that is seems pretty limiting to me. And so I wanted to just ask you what you could. So the trouble with open space is you need more space per person than you have in a classroom style, right? You need enough space to put all your people in a circle in the beginning. I, do, I mean, I have done open spaces where you have to, you know, there is an auditorium and that's the only place everybody can find. You figure out how to, but, um, and, and I, so another, you are, this, I'm reading these notes uh, that I, in this present, a kickoff versus not. I think that um, there's trade-offs in that. I think if you have a charismatic person speak at the beginning, it also ends up like skewing everything. And then people orient to the speaker and not necessarily to what they want. And I think with what you're talking about with this type of community, my inclination is to just go into creating the agenda with the people who are there. Another thing that I do, so IIW opens up with like kind of icebreakers for an hour. Mind you, we're running a three-day event using this. So like an, an hour of talking at the beginning isn't cutting into our time together because we're there for three days. Um, but you could think of, I mean, it could be that for the first half an hour, we do some, some, some collaborative exercise that gets everybody talking and mapping problems or I you know I don't know enough yet but that you could do something where you do something all together then you do open space and because you've seeded the field of the open space with whatever the thing was you did for half an hour together um yeah I've also seen like spectrographs work well for that like you know 
when I was a presidential innovation fellow, we got together with all the agency people and we like, they would ask a pro provocative question, right? Then everybody would be like, you know, like, I mean, everything from silly, like, you know, iPhone or Android to like serious ones. Like, do you think technology can even help the government? <laughs> right? and it was like fascinating because you're like, and then you'd ask people on the ends to kind of talk about why they gave those answers, right? And so yeah, like, yeah, yeah. that's totally um, one of the formats in the in the unconference toolbox. Um, yeah, Amy, do you have um, questions we should be thinking about while well, we think about the format, like in regard to KubeCon and like stuff we'll have to prepare and no nothing comes to mind i mean realistically uh i think just being able to get the room set up effectively for um open spaces but that's easy to do um you get one room that's part of <laughs> how this is working because that's the space that we have so don't try to be able to make like big shouty things is my only kind of real request but nothing nothing really comes to mind Although Emily said that we might be able to like leak out into the hallway outside the room or exactly um, you know, I, just, like I wouldn't I, I would not necessarily plan on being able to have like, you know, uh, like dividers in the space that sort of thing. Right. Yeah, um, but yeah, we'll be able to have table like dividing up tables and chairs breakout rooms is probably not going to be something to pursue. Except that we were, I don't know if we, I haven't caught up on the Slack channel, but like, if like one of the vendors that has a, um, those like lounge areas were willing to participate. I don't believe the lounge areas are going to be built at that point. So um, I'm, I'm kind of trying to steer away from being able to plan for that. Um, again, Monday is always a day where like things are getting built out. It's crazy. Um, <laughs> so yeah, yeah, yeah. keep self -contained. So how, how big is the room that you have? I'm not sure on that one. Um, so I think the options were 50, 100, or 200, right? In classroom and style? Classroom style. Like that's the limit. To go for the big one, the 200 person. To have 100 people. Yeah, and that's sort of pushing it. But yeah, you could do it. Well, I mean, we could also just say it's only 60 people. Like we, we can limit the number of people if we need to. Yeah, yeah. So we can, you know, like if we can't get the 200 person room, we could say a hundred person room, but we'll only allow 60 attendees or something or 50 attendees. Yeah, I mean, I would push for the biggest room you can get. Um, and the other thing is to, you know, don't put tables in it, put, just have chairs. So you put the number of people you have in the circle and then you would have um, like breakout spaces in like corners kind of, and then you would have like sort of, you would label the breakout spaces around the edge of the room. So you just have different spaces around the edge of the room. Noise is gonna end up being an issue, but you just live with it because the conversations are worth it. Right, yeah, so we'll have to follow, we'll follow up with Emily Ruff about the flexibility of the space arranging and, you know, what kind of dividers. And if you can have, I mean, if you can have a 200-person room next to a 100-person room, you do the opening in the 200-person room, and you have, you put the agenda in the hallway in between the two rooms, and then you have breakouts in each of the rooms, that would be, if you could swing that, really good. Yeah, that's actually an idea, Amy, whether... That is should... probably not possible. We are already oversubscribed as far as rooms. <laughs> like, I wish I had better answers, except that everybody wants to be able to do things on this day. Yes, I can't I think... wait until it sucks the unconference into the actual <laughs> event, because you know what? People really want to have their meetings. They, yeah. Anyway. How so, big is CubeCon? Uh, it, our last one in uh, Barcelona was roughly 8,000. Okay, so another conversation for next year is Kalia's plan for how to do unconferences inside giant conferences. So we'll have to see whether this goes and whether the author, <laughs> um, we have no control. Maybe might, but we yeah, don't. I don't oh. even have any control over any of that, but i um, happy to take it further up. So we're doing a little tiny experiment. Tiny experiment, it's good. We have a little community, you know. Yeah, this is 
Okay, where is this happening? San Diego. Oh, fun. When? November. In November. You have so much time. You're going to do so great. It's... So, Emily, do you have more questions or things we should talk about? Questions um, where we want Kalia's expertise on format trade offs? So, I think uh, the other questions that I have is uh, some of the stuff that we had talked about in the group was potentially having moderator in some of the larger conversations because there, there are topics that get a lot of attention and where like if for whatever reason I don't know somebody pulls decides to do a discussion or get an engagement on insiders insider threat and in organizations with access to um, your full cloud project, for instance. If, if you're in Azure and you've got a system admin, what are you doing to make sure that your system admin or your developer that can commit code to your production environment, whatever, how do you make sure that they have the least blast radius? So that's one of the topics that's proposed and there's a ton of people that are interested in it and it's a popular topic. We had potentially tossed around the idea of having a moderator to ensure that the conversations, one, aren't overtaken by a vendor, two, that they're staying on track and having that conversation and potentially taking notes for like things that were discussed, um, other items that were potentially brought up because the, the SIG security group would like to be able to provide some of that content back out to the community um, in a cloud native fashion. Like they're coming to us looking for cloud native security guidance being able to record some of these conversations or some of the notes from the conversations would be great, um, just as helpful information or references for anybody. Is that yeah. something that's in scope or? Yeah, yeah, I mean, this is all part of like the how do you do documentation set of questions, so, well, that piece of it. So like if, if documentation is really important, you need to set up a really, you know, uh, robust, process for that you need to remind session you need to have like basically a notes coordinator you need to have you know pick you know to find a method that will work well publicize it well push people during the event to do it um and then okay. take that and like bundle it all up into uh, like a pdf uh, if for no other reason, then people can show it to their boss and go, this is what I did, right? Um, yeah. So it's that's that's one piece of it. And that's like a whole sort of like little system within the event that you need to create. The other piece about moderators, I think that this, so if you knew that you wanted to host a session and you didn't want to be the moderator, then you could invite one of your friends or someone else to do it. Um, the thing is that that open space is really self-regulating too, in the sense that like, okay, so that people might name a conversation topic like insider threats and you might have three or four different versions of or two or three different versions of that on the wall. You, mm -hmm. you don't go, there is no convergent process. Like I've seen this happen at some badly designed unconferences where they're like, no, these things are the same. Let's jam them together. And then you have like a super big session with too many people and like people are frustrated because the topic that they put forward was slightly different than this other topic, right? And that you're, so that I would, it's like you have a documentation process, you support it happening. If you really feel like there's people who want to call topics but don't want to be their facilitators, you maybe look, you know, like Sarah, you have a little group of people who are like, if you want a facilitator person, I'll help you, right? Like maybe, okay. but your community is pretty, I mean, my sense, that's sort of like, you could do that, but I wouldn't worry about that. I think it's like the person who's calling the conversation is the decider of what they meant by the thing on the wall and the session can go the direction it's going. And if people don't like it and they want to have their own version of the conversation, they put it on the wall and they do it. Does that make sense? 
Yeah. But you're also documenting it all so you could see at the end of the day, oh, these three different sessions, three different directions, but we have all the notes. So, but. So last question that I kind of have on it, and I know we're running out of time, was um, I had brought up previously about, um, in a different call, that some sessions that I've been to have operated under Chatham House rule. Is that something that should always happen at an unconference, or is that something that, like, totally. is recommended, or is there a different way of doing it? It's really, it's culturally dependent. I mean, if you guys want to put that on the wall and say you're not tweeting who said what because we want to have a safe space, fine. Like, I, it's really just, it's totally a choice that could be made um, really reasonably. Um, but it's not, I mean, our, at yeah, I, I, think the, you. Um, I think that we wanted to, there was some interest in creating a space of, of like, I'm going to tell you about this hack that I experienced at my company, right? Where you don't necessarily want that documented. Like people would have to have that pre-approved to like, I'm going to share how my company was attacked, right? So, so and like, that, but I, yeah, think that I think that what another thing is to make it so that people are given permission to say their own rules of sharing, right? Like, so like, I'm going to tell you about what happened sessions, the, the person convening it says, I'm only sharing this with you. We're writing two sentences in the notes and, or we're, I'm checking a hundred percent before the notes go somewhere that are public that strips out my identity and any identifying information of the company. Like these are all things to think through and they're totally doable because it's a really flexible format but you, you can think about what you need to do to support people safely sharing the things they want to share. I like that idea to like, kind of like give people templates for like, if you want to have this kind of a session, you can declare such. Yeah. And that kind of gives permission, but then maybe the default is everybody take notes and can tweet like, or whatever, we, we can set some ground rules. Yeah. That's a good yeah. point, Emily. I think that's all the questions I had. We'll need to um, obviously update the ticket and I'd like to get some more feedback from the group about what they want to do. Yeah, and I think, I don't know what happened to JJ. He must have been called out because I know he was planning to come for the second half, but I but he's had experience with these kinds of conferences before. So um, so then we're going to, he's going to schedule the next meeting where we're going to be like, what do we want to do actually? Um, and then um, and then we can, uh, uh, let you know if we have other questions or if we can if we decide if it's going to be in conference thing as we're kind of and it seems like we're leaning towards um whether we uh might invite you to be involved we'll see mm -hmm. thank you so much for sharing your thanks. experience with us you're welcome and thanks emily for taking notes and amy for joining us and we'll yeah see all on slack Awesome. Much appreciated. And, and I would recommend, I'd recommend, well, I would feel like, I think Sarah would be a great facilitator for you guys, but I would recommend, um, like Sarah, or you could hire me, or you could find an open space facility. I, I lean, I don't know, I'm a, I'm a special person because I came from facilitator land and into technology. Like I can bridge the two, whereas some facilitator people facilitate neurotypical people and they do too many rainbows and flowers and the nerdy guys get frustrated. So anyway, <laughs> anyway you'll do great. Yeah. All right. Thanks. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye, Good to see you all. Bye.